at this moment. The fighting is going on between a Viet Cong infiltration force which came into the town in the early hours of this morning. They then tangled with these Korean guards who are guarding the... Uh, well, that's something I shall never forget. That was um, a film that we shot in the streets of Saigon during the opening day of the Tet Offensive in 1968. And it's used in a, a compilation film that was made for the BBC in, I think it was, it was transmitted in, yes, in 95, 1995, the 20th anniversary of the end of the Vietnam conflict. And the film is basically looking at how the BBC covered the war. Um, many of my colleagues take part in this, this compilation. Um, I don't really want to add very much to it because the film says it all. Uh, but there is one thing that I've, I've never really made public, and that was that um, during my time in Vietnam, and I was there on what's it, many occasions during 1966 and 75, and I think it was probably about the end of 66 um, that I got an approach from an organization in Saigon called the Just Pow, the Joint US Public Affairs Office which was really rather distressing because they said, um, uh, we're considering taking away your accreditation. Now, without that accreditation, which basic, basically meant that you had a, a pass, which meant that you could go anywhere, or at least anywhere within reason, where it was safe to go. Um, and if they'd taken that away from me, I simply could not have operated in Vietnam as a reporter. And so I said, well, why? Why, why are you going to take it away? And they said, well, we don't think that you're... Um, your reports are balanced. We think that they're somewhat anti-American and uh, therefore we don't think it's in our interest that you should be operating here. Well, obviously, I was extremely upset. I protested long and loud, but they said, no, no, we don't think that you're doing a good job for us. I said, well, I'm not doing working for you. I'm actually working for the BBC. Anyway, I was very upset and I went and talked to the British Embassy and they were extremely helpful, particularly the um, military attaché a brigadier who had seen quite a lot of my stuff and he didn't think they were biased at all. He thought they were pretty fair, as the BBC is obviously supposed to be. And he said, don't worry, I'll speak to my friends in the American embassy and I'm quite sure we can um, make this threat recede. And indeed he did. God bless him. And uh, my accreditation was not withdrawn. I was able to go on and make some of the reports that you're going to see in this compilation. Now, everything else I want to say about reporting the Vietnam War is there. So, I hope you find it interesting. I did. There was a short firefight uh, in which three of the Viet Cong were killed. The rest of them apparently have taken refuge. Only now, a week late, is the real truth emerging about the scope of the military disaster. As refugees and survivors reach the coast, so do details of how whole units have disappeared. After ten days on the road from the abandoned towns of Kontum and Pleiku, the front section of the biggest convoy in South Vietnam's history reached the coast. This armoured spearhead of officers, men and their families had abandoned the rest of the convoy of 150,000 civilians. The evacuation plan was a shambles. Desperate refugees walked or ran along the road. Many have already covered 200 miles in 12 agonising days since the decision to abandon the central highlands without warning. Because the refugee convoy is being chopped to pieces, a wave of helicopters is used to evacuate people to the airbase at Tuiwa. An aerial survey was made by the Deputy Prime Minister, Dr. Fan Quang Dan, who's in charge of the refugee programme in the whole of the country. The number of refugees uh, increases very fast. We have at the present time about 900,000 refugees. Minister, with this number of refugees, nearly a, nearly a million, does this, is this the end of South Vietnam as it was? What do you mean by the end of South Vietnam? Well, you've lost the eight provinces in the last week or so. 
Well, it's a setback for the time being. South Vietnam only has a handful of giant Chinook helicopters. Nearly all are being used to rescue the survivors from Convoy Bravo 7. Perhaps the real tragedy is not that half the population of the Central Highlands have fled their homes and land for good, but that so many families have been dispersed, separated. Twenty-four hours ago, this was the busiest road in what was left of South Vietnam, choked with tens of thousands of refugees pouring down it towards the capital from Binh Hoa base, just 15 miles away. Now it's completely deserted. In the last few hours, the communist army has seized the other side of Binh Hoa bridge and is on the very doorstep of Saigon. The gravity of the situation is underlined by the arrival of the paratroops, the best soldiers in South Vietnam's emasculated army. With shots whistling around, the South Vietnamese start evacuating their ammunition dump beside the bridge, in case it takes a direct hit. A stray rocket sets off a fuel storage depot on the side of the river held by the communist troops. The shooting is starting to intensify. Five hours have passed and the bridge hasn't been retaken. It's presumed that the communists, the North Vietnamese of Viet Cong, are dug in in foxholes on the other side of the riverbank. And this is a very humiliating day for the South Vietnamese army. And we're hoping that this is the very last battle outside Saigon. Dawn on the last day. The last helicopter came in for a handful of US Marines. A humiliating end to the American presence. We try to show our neutrality, the fact that we were not Americans, by fixing a Union Jack to our hired car. Most Vietnamese were fully engaged in plunder. Ten minutes to nine on the morning of the final American departure. The last Americans left the embassy complex about 25 minutes ago, and the fate of the embassy is very clear. It's now being systematically looted from floor to floor and part of the building has been set on fire. The fire brigade was one of the few functioning institutions with officers who had stayed at their jobs. In the chaos, the cavalcade of President Min drove by to broadcast the surrender of South Vietnam. A former GI appeared, distraught after five fruitless days looking for his Vietnamese wife. Chop is gone, I think. Well, no, is there any other way we can get the hell out of here? Maybe I can travel with you guys or something. We're staying down at the Caravel Hotel. There's some uh, right. British correspondents there. Then you there. can do me a favour. But how come you missed the last chopper? I was I was at these people's house. It was curfew. You yeah. understand? Yeah. No. I've got tickets for the two kids. I've got some, you know, papers for these people. They're Vietnamese. They're Vietnamese, but they're with me, and it means a lot to some other Vietnamese people back home. Can you do me a favor? If I can stay with you guys and get these two children with me? Yeah, and sure. You've got some sister. money for the hotel and so on. I'll get somebody. Sounds like an incoming rocket. We better yeah. get out. Okay. Such were the final moments of blind panic. Personal survival first. The lack of concern for the weakest and the helpless was never more apparent. A handful of government tank crews and troops lingered at their positions unaware of how fast the communists were advancing. One soldier was to die at this spot within the hour, after hearing the surrender broadcast. With the panache of a general pattern, the first North Vietnamese tank swept into Saigon. The last will and testament of Ho Chi Minh was being fulfilled. the people of Saigon tried to react as if they all felt this was liberation. The conquering tanks burst straight into the presidential palace. For the fourth time in a month, the presidential palace had new occupants, but these had come to stay. Inside, General Min, president for only 36 hours, awaited the communist generals. 
It was time for President Min's farewell to the palace, a man who had no option but to surrender Saigon or risk its destruction. As the palace surrendered, the first Viet Cong reached Tudor Street, delirious with joy. For the first time in 20 years, the face of Ho Chi Minh was on display. This was our car. We started off the morning with the Union Jack. The Union Jack's still intact, but the car isn't. It was taken at gunpoint by a South Vietnamese Army colonel, the man in charge of this sector of Saigon, and he was determined to die or to kill the North Vietnamese and communist troops. The car was a write-off because a North Vietnamese, a communist tank, ran right over it. The defeated army did a striptease en masse, leaving their incriminating uniforms behind. For the victors, these were heady moments. Through their superbly coordinated offensive and the unexpected collapse of Saigon's forces, from start to finish, Operation Ho Chi Minh had lasted just 51 days. Christ was born across the sea with the glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me as he died to make men holy. Let us die to make men free his truth. 